You're watching WUWT-TV, live on the web. Welcome back to WUWT. Today we're going to be talking to Dr. Sebastian Luning, who is calling us all the way from Germany. He's a geologist who has co-authored a book called The Cold Sun, or in English, The Cold Sun, which has caused quite a stir in Germany during its release, uh, talking about how solar cycles affect our, our planet and temperature and so forth. He's joining us from Germany now, and I'd like to introduce him. Hello, Sebastian. Hello, Anthony. Thanks uh, for having me on the program. It's quite an honor to have you here. I understand that uh, you are um, getting quite a bit of, um, well, for lack of a better word, flack for uh, publishing your book in Germany. Yeah, that's right. So um, we uh, are, well, uh, we are used to uh, hearing all the catastrophe and news uh, from uh, a lot of institutes here and uh, that there are other um, alternatives of uh, interpreting the data uh, was not so well known. So uh, together with my co-author Fritz Fahrenholt, who used to be uh, an, an environmentalist, in fact, in the past, uh, we have looked at all the data and uh, looked at alternative interpretations and we have written that book and it indeed stirred a lot of interest and also controversy. What kind of um, what kind of topics are you covering in this book? What what are you sp speaking about specifically that's different, that's new? Yeah, of course there are a lot of books on the market. Uh, on the German market, there were not many, uh, and uh, I think uh, one of the yeah, characteristics of our book is that we have something like eight hundred uh, scientific references mostly peer-reviewed literature in the back, so uh, all or most of what we really say in the book uh, can be uh, checked against the uh, literature. And um, I was very surprised that there is so much uh, yeah, non-consensus out there in the scientific community, and it can be referenced, and, and it's still being ignored. So that, that was uh, a really a journey through the scientific literature, which took one and a half years. And uh, yeah, we have something like uh, 60 pages of references at the end. Uh, yeah, I think that, that was um, the challenge to write a book that's still readable for uh, normal people, but on the other hand, it's also fully accountable to the science. As I understand it, your co-author, uh, Fritz Fahrenholt, was actually uh, what some people would describe as a, a green crusader earlier in his career, and he did an about-face in publishing this book. Uh, is, is that essentially correct? Yes. Uh, so I have to say that uh, um, it, he was very brave to do this, but he saw that there was a, a mismatch from the scientific information that there was available and, uh, and the interpretations. So uh, he took uh, all his courage, and uh, I uh, really uh, commend him for that. Uh, it's really something where he was convinced, and I am also convinced. A lot of people are convinced that what we are doing is right. We need to bring that other side of the discussion to the table. And uh, yeah, so I think the discussion is changing gradually. There are now institutes in Germany and elsewhere who actually do uh, investigate natural features. They find things that don't match the IPCC view and uh, the discussion is, is opening up. So I think it, it was uh, worth doing it. In your book you talk about the sun as a climate driver. What led you to come to this conclusion even though there have been lots of published studies that suggest that there's no linkage whatsoever between the sun and climate? Yeah, I'm a geologist as you mentioned at the beginning and uh, geologists uh, look into the past in order to understand patterns, natural patterns that is of course mostly uh, the industrial a signal if there is any uh, started only 1850 so geology goes back millions of years so um, I uh, as 
looked at the geological evidence and what I saw was really surprising. Uh, it was not really mentioned uh, in the press or in, on television and, and so forth. It is, there are natural cycles. And uh, yeah, when I saw that for the first time actually in a book by Fred Singer uh, and, and the co-author, uh, I was really surprised and I investigated further and uh, yeah, those cycles, climate cycles are in synchronicity with uh, solar activity and it's, it's amazing and how can that be ignored? So that was my starting point. Well, you've prepared a PowerPoint presentation for us and I assume you're going to be covering a number of those items that you just talked about in that PowerPoint. So without further ado, I'm going to connect that up here and have you uh, begin that presentation. You'll be able to advance it, of course, using the remote web clicker that we've uh, put together for this purpose from your end. And uh, I'll be monitoring should you have any difficulty. And we'll, uh, without further ado, it's now online and it is all yours. Go. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, I've put uh, together a few slides uh, and uh, yeah, so um, let me see how technology goes okay so yeah so the first slide uh, should be visible now um it is it is okay so the book is illustrated on that slide it's not meant to be advertisement or anything it's in german so you will not be most of the people out there will not be able to read it we are preparing an english version and uh hopefully it's coming soon so you also see on that slide my course of Fritz Fahrenholt, uh, with whom I've cooperated very uh, intensely on that one. So let's go straight to the next slide here. So this should be the uh, book by Fred Singer and Dennis Avery. Uh, it was called Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years. And uh, I actually found it uh, myself in the New York bookstore when I was uh, participating in the New York Marathon. And I uh, really couldn't uh, put it away before the race. I was reading it all the time. And uh, yeah, it was published 2006. And um, yeah, it's the natural cycle, the 1500 years, we will be talking about that. Uh, it's, it's probably more a mixture of uh, something like 2000 and 1000, but uh, it is a natural cycle. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is... Uh, the Danskart Oesker cycles, yes. The uh, Danskart Oesker cycles during the last ice age. Yes. Yeah, uh, there is literature about this kind of cycle. Um, it is uh, very well documented from the Pleistocene, which is the last ice age, so something like uh, uh, 100,000 years ago to uh, 12,000 years ago. And um, yeah, you, you see this sawtooth pattern, it's arranged in, in groups of cycles. Um, the, yeah, nobody really knows exactly how these natural cycles of temperature jumps of up to 10 degrees centigrade, uh, how they formed, but uh, there's a couple of uh, theories out there. It might be a mixture, in fact, of uh, two solar cycles, a Gleisberg cycle, 90 years, and a Seuss de Vries cycle, which would be 200, 210 years. It's even Stefan Ramsdorf, one of the IPCC supporters, uh, who said that. So even here, the sun could play a role, but um, yeah, you already see there are mechanisms out there, even though this is in the ice age, not really comparable with the time today, which can create uh, huge natural cycles. Okay, move over to the next slide. Uh, and uh, of course, we uh, should check against what is the primary signal in the solar activity. And that's easy to do. So we have uh, solar activity data, proxy data, we say. Uh, these are uh, isotopes. Uh, beryllium and C14. So we can actually reconstruct that um, solar activity back uh, in time. And uh, yeah, we, we can run a frequency analysis uh, through the, in, in, with this data. And we see um, that there is a 2300 cycle Years, year cycle, which is a Hallstatt cycle, and uh, something like a thousand year cycle, the Eddy cycle. We have already talked about Gleisberg and the De Vries with 90 and 210 years, and then 
most of you will know the 11-year uh, cycle, which is uh, uh, the most well-known, and we can measure that with satellites and everything. So we don't see any 1,500-year cycle here. So also there recently was another paper saying that, yes, uh, the 1,500 is actually a statistical mixture of the 1,000, the eddy cycle, and the Hallstatt. Okay, so, but, um, uh, of course, um, Singer and Avery were right. Uh, it is the same signal that they were reporting. It's just uh, how you term it in, in terms of uh, years. Okay, a very important paper in that respect was written in 2001. It appeared in Science, and the um, first author was Gerard Bond, or Gerard Bond. It was a, a large group of people in there. Uh, and uh, what they did is they analyzed um, cores, geological cores from the Atlantic, North Atlantic, in fact, and they looked for a climate signal and they found one. There were uh, layers of uh, debris from iceberg, uh, icebergs, so ice rafted uh, debris that sank down uh, to the seafloor. And we'll look for uh, the next slide here. Okay, so. This is how it works. There are um, icebergs uh, separating from, from the Arctic. And uh, of course, it makes sense. The colder the climate, the further south this, uh, these icebergs will drift. And they will release uh, the rocks that they have carried from the Arctic area with them. So uh, now the team looked at uh, the sediments in the uh, Atlantic and they found that uh, yeah, every thousand years really, or sometimes 2000 years, uh, they, they found one of these layers. Uh, so during those times, it must have been extremely cold. And uh, so they could put together actually um, a climate curve for um, yeah, the North Atlantic for the last 10,000 years. Uh, and then, yeah, We'll go over to the next slide, and this is actually one of the charts that they came up with. Uh, in uh, blue, you see the solar activities based on, um, in this case, C14, so carbon isotope. Uh, if it's going up, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a less active sun, and going down, it's a more active sun. And in black, you have got the temperature. That was reconstructed by these uh, drop stones from the icebergs. You see that there's a high level of uh, uh, correlation and synchronicity. And yeah, sun and climate were always or mostly in parallel uh, and for the last 10,000 years. This is a fantastic result. Um, yeah, right. Um, Gerard Bond, I would say, he was one of the pioneers of this kind of work, natural cyclicity. Very unfortunately, he passed away in 2005, uh, and he was uh, with the Alam and Doherty Earth Observer Observatory in uh, Palisades, New York. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we should not forget his work, and actually his work is living on, as we will see in, in the coming minutes. So, um, yes, uh, there was not just one paper where Gerard Bond uh, was uh, participating or really leading. It was here another paper in Science 2003, uh, where Hu is the first author. And here they analyzed the climate cycles in a lake in Alaska. And again, the same cycles, climate cycles, in parallel with the solar activity. In the same, uh, yeah, that's exact, exactly the same timing also as in the North Atlantic. So more evidence now, Pacific, Atlantic, solar, that, that fits very well. Okay, we'll go to the next uh, thing here. Uh, when I discovered that uh, yeah, two, three years ago, I, uh, yeah, I was really surprised, and uh, Stefan Ramsdorf, being one of the key climate scientists here in Germany, he runs a blog, and uh, yeah, I took my courage, all my courage, and asked him, so th there must be something wrong, has that been ignored? Uh, there is this um, data set out there since 2001, and it's not being mentioned, so uh, what's going on here? And then he replied in his blog, he said, well, you know, 
nice paper, but uh, there has been no uh, confirmations of uh, these cycles. They could not be reproduced by other scientists. And in fact, in later years, Bond did not believe his results himself. Ramstorff told me, and uh, so he suggested it's a dead end street in climate science. Well, okay. Uh, I first believed that, but then I thought, well, better check it out uh, yourself. And uh, this then I did, and uh, it was a big surprise that I found more papers. Uh, here is one from 2005, so the year where Bond unfortunately passed away. And again, I see, yeah, I see his name here. It's again these millennial scale cycles, as they are called. And uh, it's now the last interglacial, so not the, the warm time we are living in now, but it's more of the same, really. They find these cycles uh, all over the place. And yeah, I, I asked uh, one of the co-authors of this paper, uh, is that true that Bond did not believe in his work anymore at the end? And he said, no, he, he was still working on that and uh, he was still going strong on it and, and not quite the contrary. So that, that was, hmm, uh, that was strange again, huh? wasn't it? Uh, uh, okay, so let me move on to the next thing. We're on the... In we're on the bond yeah. cycles in Southeast Australia right now, slide. Exactly, this one. So uh, now to the topic, uh, what Ram sort of suggested that, that these cycles could not be reproduced. Well, we find them again here in a very recent paper, January 2012, Quaternary Research is the journal. A case study from Australia, and uh, you see the upper curve here in black, it's the precipitation, so rainfall. And uh, in uh, red, uh, you've got the temperature curve, and uh, there's a couple of bars, which are um, the bond cycles from the North Atlantic, which are solar driven. So again, the, the timing is exactly the same uh, as in Alaska, as in North uh, Atlantic, as uh, the uh, solar cycles. So more really proof and another confirmation that these cycles that Bond found are, are very relevant and, and uh, need to be uh, researched in much more detail. Okay, and then there are more studies. Now we are here in uh, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Uh, we do see here a blue curve, which is the temperature, and uh, we see a red curve, which is the solar activ activity. It's all smooth, but uh, you see I think uh, at the first glance that there's a high degree of correlation again. This synchronicity is, is amazing. And uh, this paper was published, Clairou et al. in February 2012. This research is hot, it's going on, and it is uh, something that there is no consensus out there that natural cycles don't play any role. No, quite the opposite. Research shows these are uh, to be counted with. Uh, Dr. Lunning. I have a bit of a question here regarding this this graph. The um, the graph that you have up now has the cycles go out of sync at the beginning and at the end of the data. Do you have any idea as to why that might be? Yes, uh, it is obviously a natural system, and it's one thing is the sun. But uh, as we know, um, there are other mechanisms out there which can. Um, yeah, disturb this uh, cooperation, this, this correlation. Uh, for example, what we know is uh, at a shorter time scale, there are 60 year cycles, which are also the Pacific decadal oscillation or the Atlantic multi decadal oscillation. So these, we call them auto cycles, uh, can also contribute and uh, can, can help to bring it out of sync. Okay, that, uh, that's, that, that's good. I just wanted to get an idea for our viewers as to why that might be, because I, I knew that question would be obviously going through their yeah. mind pretty quickly. That, that's right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have to stress out uh, there is never being a one-to-one -one correlation because we are dealing with so many different parameters. And even today, uh, anthropogenic uh, influence might play a role. The question is not if or but it's more how much and uh, when we look at the natural cycles it is not as much as we are told uh, this anthropogenic uh, influence and okay. we really should first do our homework with the natural cycles all right I'll let you go back to your slideshow now good so we are now in the next case study in fact uh, this is uh, Stein Hilber at all 
uh, paper, PNAS, uh, April 2012, also just this year. And uh, it's uh, research from a Chinese cave. Uh, we're seeing here the last uh, 9,000 9, years. Uh, solar activity in blue, and then uh, we have some temperature uh, precipitation uh, index here, the delta H-V-O, the uh, oxygen uh, isotopes. Uh, what this paper found is that um, the Asiatic monsoon, which brings all the precipitation, is actually pulsed and controlled by solar activity again, the same solar activity that Bond uh, correlated with uh, his climate cycle. So more proof that the bond cycles are very important all over the globe. Next paper. Uh, I don't want to bore you, but I just want to first show you this is not a local phenomenon. Uh, in the past, we were told the medieval warm time would be a local uh, North Atlantic thing. It, it's not. Uh, we are finding this all over the place, and we are finding that not only once, we are finding this in terms of a cycle. Here, an older paper, also 2001, Neff et al., uh, in Nature, uh, there was a very high degree of uh, synchronicity between solar activity and temperature in an Oman cave. Uh, and here we are seeing the time, uh, yeah, 7,500 uh, to 4,500 before Christ BC. Yeah. So another study, um, which is really interesting. Now, uh, only in October 2012, here's another nice case study from Lake Baikal yeah, in Asia. And uh, yeah, it appeared, uh, was published in the Quaternary Science Reviews, uh, Murakami et al. We see that uh, there's a series of wet periods in Lake Baikal. And uh, surprise, surprise, they coincide with solar, with the solar-induced bond cycles from the North Atlantic. So another very important data point. Um, yes, the climate is really controlled by the sun uh, in many places. Um, now, okay, Greenland, a lot of people know this curve and uh, we uh, also see uh, the latest uh, yeah, historical developments here. We, we see the medieval warm time uh, a thousand years ago. We see a Roman warm period 2000 years ago. And uh, there's more warm periods, uh, me known, Egyptian Old Kingdom one. But on the very right, we see the modern warm period. And uh, yeah, it really looks like it's uh, uh, the natural continuation of a cycle, mostly, maybe enhanced by some anthropogenic contribution. But the basic pattern is, is really something we know from the past and the geologists uh, can find that all over. Yeah, let's see where we are going now. In, in that book, we have uh, put together um, yeah, an overview here and, and the bars, the gray bars, maybe you can see them there. These are the cold periods. And um, as Anthony mentioned, there will be always here and there be deviations for regional regions uh, reasons for other reasons, but the basic pattern you will find here in, in a lot of places which are mentioned on the right side of that slide, including West Virginia, India, and uh, yeah, China in, in several studies. Okay. So what, what you're saying is you see this same kind of pattern repeated at many different locations around the world. That's right. And uh, this is really a rhythm, a natural rhythm, which uh, has to be included in every um, model. Uh, and uh, if there are models out there that cannot reproduce this natural rhythm, I would be very skeptical of these models. And unfortunately, this is what the IPCC models uh, suffer from. They are not capable of reproducing this natural pattern. And this <laughs> There should be all alarm bells really ringing when, when this is the case. Um, I think I have now switched over to that uh, map view here. Right, so, it's up the map of the world. Yeah, so these are studies, and actually there is, uh, since I produced this map, there are more data points. So you see all of these points uh, illustrating uh, studies where the bond cycle, the solar-driven thousand-year bond cycle, or 2,000 in some cases, 
uh, has been documented. So uh, I think this should be a very important um, part of uh, modern uh, climatology uh, to follow this uh, lead up. And as we see, there are scientists out there who do the research, but it should be more, maybe less modeling at the moment uh, and, and more of, of these kinds of studies. Okay. Let's uh, see where the problem really is. We, we should now see um, yeah, the very famous radiative forcing uh, chart by the uh, assessment report, uh, the last assessment report number four of the IPCC. And uh, yeah, the longer the bar, the more uh, yeah, significant, the, the, the stronger that parameter should be in terms of forcing the climate. And you see on the very top CO2 and a couple of other greenhouse gases, they have very long bars and CO2 alone is something like 1.66 watt per square meter. Uh, so this is very strong forcing, very strong climate driver in the opinion of the IPCC. And you see at the very end, uh, one little thing called natural side, uh, natural drivers and solar irradiance, solar activity changes, and it only has 0 0.12 watts per square meters. So that's less yeah, than yeah, 10, uh, sort of, one, yeah, very, very, very little, yeah, you see. And um, because of this, this is, of course, in the models, in the climate models. And because of this, the climate models are not able to reproduce the um, climate cycles that run in parallel with solar uh, activity. And, and there is a huge problem here. So, and uh, apparently nobody is bothered by it. And that's a big surprise really. Okay, I have uh, simplified that a little bit. So we are now looking at this one cycle um, and also try to incorporate the medieval warm period and the modern warm period. So let's see if that animation works here. So, um, yeah. So we are seeing um, a time scale here, um, which reaches, uh, yeah, for the last uh, 2,000, 3,000 years, 3,500 years back. And um, I have to do that here on an extra computer <clears throat> to see that animation properly. So. Okay, so the next uh, thing I hope you see on the screen is the sun, do. yeah? Okay, so there is this um, activities changes of the sun and uh, this is the thousand year cycle we have been talking about. Uh, sun has been going up and down, up and down. And uh, we are just looking, by the way, up to the year 1850. So. The next thing is uh, we're now seeing the temperature, aren't we? Yeah. This temperature is going up and down in parallel. So I've now uh, simplified what we have learned from the geological uh, evidence. And um, yeah, so we are seeing um, a cold period here. And uh, it, yeah, we are seeing um, Minoan warm period. We're seeing not the cold period, we're seeing a Roman warm period around uh, yeah, 2000 years ago. Then there is the cold period of the migration period, followed by the medieval warm period, and there is the little ice age. Okay, so the question now is what does the CO2 do during all that time? And uh, yeah, CO2 was flat, as we know. Uh, there has been no change whatsoever and uh, yeah there has been no industrial burning of fossil fuels or whatever in, in a large scale so i think this also already shows that the natural climate cycles from the pre-industrial ages uh, they have to come from the sun there is no other way yeah? so now the question is how would this natural cycle continue uh yeah maybe also if there was no industrial period. Okay, so uh, we know that um, the sun uh, has gone up, that has been measured, and we also know that the temperature has gone up. So what we have seen the last 150 years actually is uh, 
is just a continuation now as a base pattern from exactly this cycle. Now what has happened is, and I'll click one step for, uh, forward here, also the CO2 has gone up. Mm. So it is now very hard to say what has driven the temperature increase. Is it the solar activity increase? Well, it has done it uh, multiple times before, so I think uh, we can rely on that one. Or is it the CO2, um, which uh, has gone up, maybe by coincidence, maybe it has helped a little bit, but is it the main driver? So we have to be very skeptical here, because we have seen the sun has done it multiple times before. Okay, so we... Okay. We have the thousand-year cycle up now. We are now on the thousand year cycles. We are looking again at uh, real data here, not the uh, abstracted one, the simplified one. We're seeing the solar irradiance, solar activity is very much uh, yeah, in synchronicity here with the temperature. And uh, yeah, a couple of um, exceptions exist. And uh, there are, yeah, as we said, multiple reasons for that uh, auto cycles and, and what's what other things, uh, volcanoes and, and stuff. Okay, moving on to the next slide, uh, and we are zooming now to the last 150 years. So we know temperature has gone up by 0.8 degrees centigrade, uh, so less than a degree centigrade. We also know that the CO2 has climbed up. I, I, have, uh, to, I have to interrupt you here. I'm, we're a little confused on the slide sync. What, what slide are you thinking you're on now? Uh, increase of temperature, CO2, and solar activity. Okay, just wanted to be sure. The last click didn't come through. Ah, sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I've got it now. Good. Yeah, right. So uh, we are seeing uh, three um, curves here. So we are seeing the temperature, we are seeing the CO2, and the solar activity for the last 150 years. Well, in some cases, we are going 250 years back and more. So the temperature, as we know, has gone up by 0.8 degrees centigrade. CO2 has gone up by something like 100 parts per million. And uh, the solar activity at the same time has also gone up. Uh, it has, well, if you look at the last 100 years only, the uh, solar magnetic field has more than doubled. So we have three curves all going up. It's now really hard to say which one is the key driver for the temperature rise. But yeah, as you already heard, my guess is really the sun plays a major role. Move over to the next slide. And we should now see uh, a blue curve, which comes out of a paper by Sami Solanki in 2004. Uh, it's uh, published in Nature. And uh, the title already gives it away, unusual activity of the sun during recent decades compared to the previous 11,000 years. So what the paper actually says is, um, and uh, this is also in the abstract then, the last few decades uh, were some of the most active, solar active uh, times we have seen uh, since the end of the last ice age. So a very high level of solar activity. Can, can this be a coincidence given that we had this uh, strong increase in temperature. Well, I would say it's not a coincidence. And uh, yeah, let's see what else we have got in terms of evidence. Okay, we should now be seeing um, two curves here. It's uh, from the Paraná River, uh, the second uh, largest river in South America. And uh, in blue, we have got the river stream flow. So the, the river, the water output, in fact. And in red, we have the sunspot number. And uh, there's a high degree of correlation here. So solar activity actually has influenced the rainfall in that region. And uh, it's really striking, especially when you look at that IPCC chart where uh, we are told that solar activity doesn't play any role. Uh, it, it's really amazing. So move over to the next slide. Uh, and we'll now concentrate a little bit on the 11 year cycle, which is named Schwabe cycle. Uh, and um, okay, so we are seeing now um, uh, a chart from uh, beginning 1975, 
and uh, all sorts of parameters are seen here, which are pulse, pulsing in, uh, yeah, in, in parallel with the solar activity. Uh, in the upper one, in the uppermost chart, you see the sunspots. So th these are easy to measure. And then going up and down as they're supposed to do in that 11 year cycle, you're seeing radio waves, you're seeing ultraviolet, you're seeing lots of other things. There's also cosmic rays, uh, which are controlled by the solar magnetic field. And uh, total solar irradiance is the total output of the sun. And then there's a magnetic field. Now, um, the total solar irradiance, the total output only varies by uh, 0.1%. And, and this is actually the reason why a lot of the IPCC uh, supporters say, well, the sun can't have any effect because it, it's such a small level of change. And if we put that into our calculations, there is no climate signal coming out. This might be, if you put this into the calculations, indeed, there is very little coming out. But when we look back with geological techniques, we do see that, uh, that climate signal. So uh, there must be a mistake in that uh, calculations, really, rather than in, in reality, uh, because the data really shows there has been uh, a, a solar controlled climate change. OK, but you see the ultraviolet actually changes by much more. Uh, it, because in that 11-year uh, cycle, the ultraviolet changes by several percent in some, in some uh, frequencies, in fact, by up to 70 percent. That's a lot. And here you already get the feeling that ultraviolet changes could be a driver of, of, this climate, uh, of these climate change activities. Another uh, parameter are cosmic rays. Cosmic rays change by 10 percent over the 11-year cycle. And uh, yeah, if you consider the thousand year cycle, you, you have to also consider the 10% or maybe even more. Uh, so it, this is just an example here, the 11 year cycle we can measure by satellites. Uh, so there must be, or there could be uh, mechanisms via cosmic rays or ultraviolet that act as solar amplifiers so that the total solar radiance changes, they are not important. And uh, so this could really change the whole game. Um, let's uh, look at the next slide here. It's another very recent paper, 19th of October 2012, published in the uh, Geophysical Research Letters. Good journal. There's a group uh, by, uh, in the Institute of Bremen in Germany, Marum Institute. Uh, they're also working with uh, the Institute, uh, an institute in Berlin. And what they have found is very interesting. They find there is a link between the stratospheric um, ozone and uh, ozone um, concentrations and the wind systems near uh, our uh, Earth's surface. So now think of that ultraviolet. The ultraviolet will change the ozone levels in the stratosphere. And uh, if you have 10% of change in that uh, ultraviolet or up to 70 in some uh, frequencies, th there will be quite a lot of ozone change in the stratosphere, middle atmosphere. And this has been measured by satellites, meanwhile. We, we even know that in the stratosphere, temperatures are going up and down by several degrees parallel to the solar cycle. So we have a link between the middle atmosphere and, and the Earth's surface. Uh, and this has been denied for a long time, and it is it was not in the climate models, but now they are, the scientists are beginning to include it, and they're seeing, yes, solar changes, uh, they provoke and they initiate a climate change uh, at the Earth's surface in the troposphere. We're looking at the next uh, study here. Uh, another study just uh, recently published in September in Nature Geoscience. It's another team here, Thomas Reichler is uh, in uh, Salt Lake City, and there's a, a group of uh, also, uh, German scientists in here, uh, and they find a very similar thing, stratospheric uh, connection, so again the ozone and temperature, uh, to the Atlantic climate variability in the troposphere. So apparently the ultraviolet solar amplifier seems to work, at least in places, and we need more research on that, that that's very clear. 
Okay, so um, what I um, have not mentioned yet is uh, the Svensmark mechanism, of course. Most of you will know this. This is uh, the cosmic rays that uh, then help to uh, modulate the cloud coverage. That's also a very strong candidate. There is a lot of research going on in that respect. And uh, so that is the, the other uh, very hot candidate, how uh, the solar amplifier could work. Um, we are now looking at a slide, in fact, uh, it is uh, yeah, another very striking example uh, where you see solar activity changes and uh, climate are so much interlinked. Lake Victoria in East Africa. Uh, the upper graph shows the sunspots solar activity, the lower one, uh, the lake level. So if there is a lot of rainfall in the region, the lake will, level will go up and uh, if it's drier, it will go down. And you see there is uh, two phases where the lake level goes absolutely in synchronicity with the solar activity. In the middle, yes, there is again, as, as we have it in uh, climate sciences, there is a phase where it's not working. So, but yeah, I think we need a very good explanation why for so many years did that lake level uh, behave yeah, uh, in uh, synchronicity with the sun activity, solar activity. Right, uh, another very recent paper here, 18th of October 2012, uh, where a team showed that uh, um, the uh, rainfall, the precipitation in uh, Sweden um, was uh, in synchronous to the solar activity in the 13th and 18th century. And in fact, there was also very good correlation um, for since 1960. So again, a miracle if we believe the IPCC models, but uh, yeah, there is a lot of new papers. And we have uh, one more here, November 2012, hot out of the press really, Baltic sea ice controlled by solar activity during the past 500 years. Uh, so they took um, proxies, so data for, about that uh, Western Baltic uh, sea ice, and again it was uh, in parallel with solar activity. It's really amazing. And uh, even if you look at the temperatures and you uh, deduct El Nino and volcanoes, you see the 11 year solar cycle in, in that uh, graph. But we have to say that El Nino and volcanoes, they are a very strong disturbing signal. So that, that's really a tricky thing to do. So we rather look uh, at um, longer term curves uh, where, where that problem is, is not so significant. Okay, the question is, what's happening in the next yeah, 5, 10, 20, 30 years? Um, yeah, so uh, can we use any of that knowledge um, to predict the climate or at least get an idea? Is it going up? Is it going down? What's going to happen? And we should now be looking at uh, a graph, a NASA graph, the uh, yeah. sun. Uh, and we all know um, the 24th uh, solar cycle is very weak. And uh, there's even now talk that the maximum on the northern, northern hemisphere of the sun has already happened uh, in, in summer 2011. And, and actually uh, you're seeing that this maximum is not really very much, very well uh, expressed. Uh, so the highest peak was already, uh, yeah, back in, in couple, many months ago, yeah. Um, yeah, so this uh, solar, weak solar cycle has prompted uh, quite a few scientists and I would even say the majority of solar physicists to say, well, this is just the beginning of a trend and we are going to see a very weak sun, not only this solar cycle, but also until 2020, 2030, maybe even 2040, so grand minimum. And if that's the case, and if what we have learned from the geology, that there has been a strong link between solar activity and climate. If that's true, then temperatures should go down in the coming years and uh, yeah, even few decades. And uh, yeah, that's, that's one thing that's uh, very interesting. Now we are looking at the Gleisberg and Seuss de Vries cycles. These are the yeah, 
roughly 90 years and 210 years, these are the two cycles which are actually going down now. Th this is the reason why the current solar cycle is so weak. And, um, okay, let me have a look here. And the next slide should be here, the 210 Sous de Freeze cycle. It's a chart that uh, has been published by a Russian colleague, Abdu Samatov. And uh, what you see is, uh, yeah, a very uh, weak solar activity around 1810. Yeah, that's the last minimum of that 210-year cycle. Yeah, and we are now heading straight into the next one. So 1810 plus 210 years uh, brings us straight into yeah the, the present uh, age really. And uh, yeah, he predicts here in this paper the minimum uh, around 2040. So other people say 2030, but we are already in that decline phase. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not just uh, up to Samatov. Here is a paper from Clilvert and others, 2006. And uh, yeah, they uh, already made this prediction there that the solar activity would go down. At the time when they published this, uh, they got a lot of criticism from uh, their yeah, colleagues, really. How could you predict something like that? The solar activity is unpredictable, but in fact, they were absolutely right. So the solar activity was going down, and it's the same kind of approach that Abtun Zalmatov is doing. You look at the uh, larger scale cycles, and uh, you superimpose them, and you look where is that uh, heading to. Right. Uh, I think even in the IPCC camp, uh, it is accepted that at least this is a possibility that uh, solar activity is going down. Then uh, here is a paper uh, by uh, Stefan Ramstorff and, uh, and a colleague, and they are using, of course, the IPCC formula where the sun doesn't play any major role, ignoring the very good correlation of the past between uh, solar activity and climate. And, and they then say, well, even if that uh, minimum is coming, it's just a few tenths of a degree and uh, CO2 will uh, overrule everything. Well, I don't think this is uh, very uh, likely because um, yeah, we have seen the IPCC formula is, is not working, at least not for the past, and I also think not for the future. In another paper here, Jones and others, uh, the same uh, thing really, so they even see less influence here by that uh, grand minimum and uh, yeah, I would not take these papers uh, too seriously because, uh, as I said, they are not uh, considering any solar amplifiers like the ultraviolet or the cosmic ray cloud link, whatever it is. We know from the geological data there has to be an amplifier. Okay, right. what slide are you on right now? Yeah, I would now go to the very la well, last slide uh, where there's temperature prognosis coming from our book. From where? Uh, yeah, from, uh, from our book, uh, our schematic temperature prognosis. Okay, uh, I've got it. Okay. Yeah, we got out of sync again. Here we go. It's up now. Okay. Yeah, so, um, of course, it's very hard to predict the uh, future temperature uh, development. But uh, we can uh, think, um, see a couple of uh, things that uh, have been correlated in the past, and uh, those things should also be true for the future. So, for example, the link between solar activity and climate, we should also use in the, in the future. There have been the 60-year cycles, um, natural cycles, uh, such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillations that is going up and down every uh, 60 years. Uh, and we have put those things together and also added um, a uh, certain yeah, warming effect by carbon dioxide. So we went uh, to a climate sensitivity of one to one and a half degrees per CO2 doubling. And this would be really the maximum in my understanding and uh, could be much less in fact. But if you put all of that together, you would see that from now onwards, uh, yeah, you, you would continue a little bit with the temperature plateau that we have seen for the last 16 years. And then it's probably going down because the solar activity is going down. 
So also the uh, PDO cycle is, is going down and in other cycles, uh, CO2 will not be able to make up for that initially. Uh, yeah, if CO2 is, is doing that warming of one or one and a half degrees per doubling, then uh, yeah, the, the temperature would go up uh, by at the maximum of another degree until 2100. This would be very different to the IPCC prognosis with uh, warming of four degrees or whatever. So we would be going away from an alarmist scenario to some scenario which I think we can still handle, still have to do something about it. But uh, yeah, we, I think our main task would be to work out the real um, distribution of the natural cycles. This, this would be the most important thing. Would be the end of, of my slides here. So for those of you who uh, yeah, speak German, then we have a blog, kaltesonne.de. Uh, there's also lots of things on uh, Anthony Watts' uh, blog, so <laughs> you will always have uh, enough to read. Thanks. It was great to have you here, and um, I have a few questions for you based on uh, some of the notes I've taken while we went through this. Um, Early on, you were talking about uh, Avery and Singer's book and their 1,500-year cycle that you said couldn't be found. W what is the reason that w they found it, but you could not? Can you give me an idea on that? Yeah. I think, um, actually, we uh, both mean the same, and it's just really about the question putting a number to that cycle. Um, we've seen the um, primary solar activity does not have a 50-year 1500 year cycle and this has been used in the past by uh, yeah, critics that this can't be true uh, and that's right in the primary signal there's no 1500 years but now just imagine you have the 2300 year cycle and you have a thousand year cycle we call them Hallstatt and Eddy and uh, they uh, if you um, mix them uh, so superimpose them statistically you might actually end up getting the 1500. And there has been another paper recently out there in the peer-reviewed literature, and they say exactly that. So there is no 1500 year per se, but it is a mixture. So statistically, you, you end up having, having this one, the 1500, yeah. Okay, one of the things that uh, I was um, also questioning was, um, Excuse me here a second. I have to take off my super. There we go. Um, the interesting study that you had there where you had bond cycles could not be reproduced uh, in later studies. What do you think is the main reason why, again, one study would find the bond cycles and then later they could not? Yeah. So that statement by Stefan Ramsdorf uh, that the cycles could not be reproduced, yeah. It's, it's unfortunately wrong, and this is uh, really disappointing that, uh, that he said that, because uh, now we have a study uh, every other month, really, where that cycle is uh, reproduced and it's confirmed. So, yeah, it's not true. The, the cycle is out there and has been reproduced. Bond also believed in the cycle until the end, and it's not a dead end uh, of science. It is really something which is absolutely relevant and is more for something for the future. All righty. The um, next question I have is, um, a lot of people look at these different types of studying of cycles, uh, the solar cycles, the uh, UV cycles, um, the periodicities and orbits, things, all, all kinds of different things there. And some people claim that all we're really doing is pulling out imagined cycles, or some people call it cyclomania, where we're, we're looking for relationships that we, s we find these things because we're seeking them, but they may not actually be true. What do you do to test to make sure that you're not falling uh, prey to some kind of a, a confirmation bias in cyclomania type uh, presentations? That's right. Uh, yeah. So um, it is, of course, uh, always uh, tempting to uh, force a correlation, and and this is something that should be absolutely avoided. And uh, so there are studies, in fact, where you don't find that link, and some people start 
depending time frames and, uh, and and other things. So um, I think proper statistics is very important, and the pa the papers that uh, I have cited here. Uh, they are using uh, proper statistics and they are checking whether the cycle is there or not. Um, and uh, yeah, one, one should be really honest about that. Uh, there are some regions, as it is the case today. Uh, the the world is not one, uh, yeah, one uh, own, one only one development. There's a lot of developments going on and there will be always regions where the bond cycle is not represented. Yeah? At the moment, uh, temperatures uh, in Antarctica are declining, whereas in other areas uh, they are going up or, yeah, well, actually we have a plateau for the last uh, 15, 16 years. So we always have to also account for the high uh, complexity of the climate system. And yes, it, it is statistics in the end. Okay. Another question I have for you is that you have a graph up uh, about Lake Victoria that showed a good and then poor correlation between solar activity, uh, almost as if there was some kind of a tipping point that goes on uh, related to that. Can you explain how that might happen? Uh, is there any kind of, uh, anyone proposed any mechanism as to why all of a sudden there would be good correlation or, or there'd be a poor correlation and then later good correlation? Yeah, that's of course uh, a very important question. Uh, I don't have a solution to that. Uh, and um, again, there is so many other things going on. Yeah, tipping points, you mentioned that uh, maybe there are certain conditions where um, a little bit of more sun would uh, give a little bit of more rain, but then you reach maybe a certain threshold where the whole system goes crazy. Uh, maybe they're also, well, maybe not in uh, that lake, but yeah, no, I think there have been uh, artificial dams in, in some uh, times, and uh, so all of this has to be checked out. Um, I think rather than uh, emphasizing the non-correlation in the middle, uh, one should say, well, isn't it interesting that during certain times there is a correlation and uh, we need yeah, a model for that, how that uh, works. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's always more interesting the the times where the correlation is there, huh? present. I've often thought that there might be something like a transistor effect where um, we have a small signal that comes into uh, the Earth's atmosphere and climate system uh, that the system is sensitive to in a way that is more sensitive perhaps than some other aspects to it. And so that gets amplified in a different way somehow in the Earth's climate system, kind of like how a transistor will amplify a small signal to a larger output. Do you think something like that might explain the whole situation with Lake Victoria and that lack of correlation over certain periods and then a sudden correlation? Yeah, that, that's a very good idea. In, in fact, uh, yes, um, as, we, as we've seen, there's all sorts of amplifiers and sometimes they are positive, sometimes they are negative. Uh, yeah, maybe um, this uh, could be one explanation and uh, we would, uh, of course, encourage uh, the scientists that are yeah, having uh, uh, time to do this, uh, to, to really follow this up, yes. Do you have any final words for us, anything in closing to kind of sum up what you found uh, and, and, and your book and perhaps any final thoughts you might have? Yeah. Um, one thing I'm I'm still amazed of is um, that uh, there is uh, really on a weekly basis very interesting papers that um, yeah support or provide more evidence for the natural cycles, and still this is not being heard so much in the IPCC community. So it's very easy to just ignore these papers and uh, yeah, I also appreciate that scientists maybe who are working on that, they, they fear a little bit to come out and, and really stress their point um, because they will uh, get into trouble for that. But yeah, I would like to encourage everybody to look more carefully at these natural cycles, open-minded and yeah, uh, without a um, result already in mind, uh, just uh, like science should be. 
open-minded and uh, then at the end just decide on the basis of the evidence and uh, yeah we have to really follow up the literature there's really interesting things there's no consensus in, in the science scientific community and uh, yeah we, we have to really go on with the research okay very good we're coming up on our hour of time thank you very much for your presentation and for your courage in publishing your results along with your co-author uh, in the cult son and uh, we'll have that book available uh, as a link on WWT. And again, uh, Dr. Uh, Sebastian Luning from Germany, we thank you very much for being with us, and we'll have a new presentation coming up in the next hour. Thanks again, and stay tuned. Thank you.